one month after the children of Israel had been delivered out of Egypt, they found themselves most likely beginning to run out of food. You think about it just from a logistical standpoint, more animals have been slaughtered to feed the millions of hungry mouths that they had. And as they were beginning to see that stock probably dwindle down, they were beginning to wonder, what are we gonna start eating now? You're in the wilderness, desolate place, your food's running low, what are you gonna do? When you think about it from one perspective, God most likely had them at a point in time where he wanted them, and yet they didn't want him. And sometimes you and I can think through times in our lives when we felt like we were pretty self-sufficient and we probably didn't utter the words, I don't need God, but we thought, I don't need anybody's help. I can do this on my own. I wonder sometimes if that's possibly what the children of Israel could have been at, at that point in time. But we know that they, as a result, began to murmur greatly. And they began to murmur against Moses, against Aaron, and against God. And they began to tar start talking about going back to Egypt. The story, as we know, is found in Exodus chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to read through this particular chapter and spend a little bit of time in it today. I think it's important because it, it speaks to more than even just the physical bread that is referenced here. But beginning in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 16, it says, Then they set out from Elam on the... Uh, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt, this would have been a month later, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died in the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat, and we ate bread to, at the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You know, you think about that, and you know, again, our minds probably go to, they saw things that you and I haven't seen as far as miraculous events. And they saw their whole condition in life change from slave to free people, to free people with some wealth, that they left Egypt with, and just one month later, they fall into this mindset. How many times have you and I witnessed and seen God work in a powerful way for us, for something we prayed for, and then over the course of a very short period of time, when things start getting bad, clouds start building on the horizon, so to speak, and we begin to think, well, I guess God's just totally forgotten me now. My mind goes to Elijah. Elijah being pursued by Jezebel and his whole comment of, well, I guess now I'm just going to die after doing exactly what God wanted me to do. And Elijah being told that, you know, I have thousands of people who have not even bail or bent a knee to bail. And also go back to Elijah being provided for by ravens. You know, you think about how did God provide for him as he was in hiding in these caves? He sent birds with food to him. Is there anything God can't do? Yet sometimes we look the same way at life, the way the Israelites did here. Verse four, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread. So, you know, we, we don't know, maybe Moses went before God, but God heard what they said. He had the ears to hear. I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they, they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel at evening, you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord. He hears your grumbling against the Lord. And what are we? and that you grumble against us. Moses said, this, this will happen. When the Lord gives you meat 
to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. So God, in some regards, is going to be turning the tables on them to test them. He says, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he heard your grumblings. It came about that as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the clouds. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning... You shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. You know, they had seen God perform miraculous signs in Egypt in their delivery, but he apparently still wasn't real to them. And I say real to them from the standpoint of they didn't believe. They didn't see what he really was. Verse 13, and it came about that at evening, as the quails came down and covered the camp in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flaky thing, fine as the frost of the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For we do not know what it is. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it, every one, as much as he should eat. And you shall take an omer, a piece, according to the number of persons you shall have in your tents. In other words, they weren't to be greedy. They weren't to get more than what they needed and stockpile it. They were to get what they needed. And the amount was an omer, which, you know, is, is an amount needed for that day to sustain and to live through. Verse 17, and the sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. And when they measured it with an omer, he had gathered as much as had no excess, and he had gathered little, had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should. So even though some were greedy, God still made sure that the ones that weren't greedy still had plenty. Knowing the heart of man, knowing the thoughts of man, and how many times that can happen even with us. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses and some part of it until morning and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. This is part of God's testing. And they gathered it morning by morning and every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted away. So they had to get out early. They had to do it early in the morning. They couldn't wait to just do it when they wanted to do it. They were told a specific time. They were told to get a specific amount. And even when they didn't do that, God still provided. And this was bread that was coming to them every day. And they weren't to stockpile it. They were to need, do what they or obtain what they needed for that day. Verse 22, except for obviously the sixth day. Now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, and then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all this left over put aside to be kept until the morning. So they put it aside until morning, and as Moses had ordered, and it did not become foul, nor was there any worms in it. Another miraculous sign. They were told on this one day you get twice as much, but every other day you only get what you need. Verse 25, Moses said, eat it today. Today is the Sabbath. Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. And it came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They still could not follow simple directions. How many times can you and I not follow simple directions? It's something for us to think about as we read this example and we read this story, because it goes much deeper than just the story about Israel 
and um, a, a good time story for our children. Verse 28, and then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place and let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. You know, it's interesting, too, when you think about it. These were slaves. They were told to work seven days a week. They didn't have a choice in Egypt. And they wanted to go back to having no choices. And yet God was forcing rest on them. And how many times do you and I want to pick and choose what we do on the Sabbath? And we want to do certain things on the Sabbath because it's a day that's just going to be convenient for us to do it. Verse 31. And the house of Israel named it manna. And it was like a corn seed, white, and its taste was like a wafer with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations, that you may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Of course, we know that it was a part of what was in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. And how many times is he going to say this omer? It's a specific amount. And what he puts there is going to be kept even when manna stops and it doesn't become foul. It doesn't have worms in it because it's a, a reminder, not something to be worshipped, but a reminder. Verse 34, and the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron, uh, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. And the sons of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came into the inhabited land. And they ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is a tenth of an ephod. If you don't know what an ephod is, I don't know what the point of knowing where an omer is. I don't even know what that really is other than it's been estimated to be just what is needed for that daily amount. It's interesting in other scriptures where this Nehemiah 9.15, Psalm 78.24, it's, it's oftentimes referred to in scripture as the bread from heaven, yet the Israelites called it manna. It is, though, called in, in Psalm 78.25, the angels food or the food that the angels eat off of which i think is interesting as well we think about this great event that we read in this chapter and it is a wonderful story unique story is it just a natural phenomena god had done, definitely done some natural phenomena and is egypt as well as what he was doing in the wilderness or is it divine providence and provision that he was giving let's turn over to numbers chapter 11. numbers chapter 11 there's a little part here that's given in Numbers 11. It's somewhat similar in nature to what we just read, but there's something this, I, I wanted to point out that's a little different listed here. Verses 6 through 10, it says, But now our appetite is gone, and there's nothing at all to look at except this manna. So even over the course of time, familiarity breeds content. We hear that. Well, they become so familiar with manna, and the miracle is happening every morning before them, every day for 40 years, they were, they drew contempt for it. it. Goes on to say, now the manna is like a corn seed and its appearance is like that of a bellin. And the people would go out and gather it and grind it into two millstones and beat it into a mortar and boil it in a pot and make cakes with it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. So it was, it was very nice tasting apparently. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. And this is after years of this. So this contentment was very, very short-lived, and even with great miracles being provided on an ongoing basis daily, they still complained and still murmured. God gives us many things on a daily basis, and yet we think we need more. Something for us to think about. You think about, well, what was the purpose for the manna? Let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, even before what we read in Deuteronomy 16. But Deuteronomy chapter 8 is 
again, a highlight of why it was so important for this and why it was so important that this miracle occurred and what God was looking at when he saw this, or they saw the reaction to the people. Verse three, Moses said, he, speaking of God, humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. We know Jesus quoted this. It wasn't like Jesus was making it up. He went right back to the Old Testament. It was from the very beginning what manna was supposed to be about. It was more than just the physical nutrition. It was looking to God to provide. And it's not about just food every day, all the time. And it is to humble ourselves so that we would rely on him to provide for us. Divine. Verse 16, in the wilderness, he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Sometimes we wonder why we go through the many afflictions we read about in the first message. It is so that we will stay close to God, even in our abundance, even when things are looking good and going well, and even in times when we may be, yes, living in a right way with a right mind and right heart. We're still going to go through afflictions to keep us humble and to keep us in a state of mind for which we will be dependent and looking to God to provide for us. And even though we will endure some hardships along the way, but sometimes it's because of the mistakes we make and we justifiably deserve what happens to us. And sometimes it's some things that we didn't really deserve, but they still happen to us for our own good. If we trust God enough. It's interesting, too, when we think about the manna, the manna continued for a long time. And it then once they entered into the promised land in Joshua chapter five, it stopped. Let's turn to Joshua chapter five. You know, they've been in their minds. A whole generation had died and their desert. Their bones are on the desert floor, wilderness floor. And anyone that was of 20 years and, and, and younger lived, and they still had this promise the whole time they're out there walking around in the desert, and they're promised this land. And then once they get the land, miraculous things again start happening. And it's always usually around one of God's holy days, too, or appointed times. But here in Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 10, when the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. And on that day after Passover, on that very day, that they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and parched grain, the manna ceased on the day after that they had eaten some of the produce of the land. So that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they had ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that, that year. It's interesting what comes after 14. 15. When did it start falling when they were a month out on the second month, 15th day? Interesting little side points, things that, you know, you can say are, are just useless facts, but I don't think there are any useless facts with God. I think they're all very relevant. If nothing else, they're very consistent. Verse 13. Now it came about that when Joshua was by Jericho, they lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite with him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals for the feet, for the place where you are standing on is holy. And Joshua did so. We go back to the burning bush episode of Moses. Holy ground is only as a result of the holy presence of the holy family, God. And in this case, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would have been the God of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ would have been the individual that it appears appeared before Joshua as the 
captain of the host of the armies of God. The writer of the book of Hebrews references him as the captain of our salvation. Jesus Christ as well. Seems very consistent. Seems as if it's a message that is, again, even down to the day, very consistent across the board. We see that, you know, with something more that was to this whole idea of the bread and the bread that was eaten, as we saw earlier in Deuteronomy, was more than just to fill them physically, although it did serve that purpose. But it was to teach them that everything was not about the physical life, but everything was to be coming from God. Let's turn over to John chapter 6. Jesus would reference this as well when he's here on the earth in a physical way as our Messiah. And we read this oftentimes this time of year, and I'm sure we'll be reading it more than one time. But we'll begin in verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves of bread and were filled. Kind of like ancient Israelites again, even though it's just a sect of them when you think about it, because it's the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and those that were at the time there. But they were truly all about filling their stomachs, Jesus is saying. But do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent, speaking of Jesus himself. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? And what work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you that it is not Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Of course, we're not talking about physical things here. We're talking about spiritual. But I say to you, in verse 36, that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Just like the Israelites saw the signs, saw the miracles, but didn't believe. These people are the same situation. You and I, if we had been at the time, we could have been in the same category. All that the Father gives to me... <coughs> will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast him out. If we have that humble, contrite spirit, God won't turn us away. For in verse 38, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that anyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because they said, I, or he said, I am the bread of life and come down out of heaven. And they were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say that I have come down out of heaven? And Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among them yourselves. Just like the grumbling and murmuring occurred back in Deuteronomy, at the time when the Israelites were getting manna for the first time, they're still grumbling. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets that they shall be taught of God, and everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. There's a key aspect there of what we're learning is that God calls, the Father calls, and no one can understand unless the Father draws. Understand the words. Understand this bread of life. Verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He's seen the Father. 
Truly, I say to you that he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. Of course, we know that led to a really bad discussion and comment as it continues on in all the way to verse 58. But the point that I'm trying to drive to today is that what we're working for in life. Many times, you know, we think, when we look at the example of the Apostle Paul, the person who doesn't work doesn't eat. Yes, we are to work, but make sure we're working for and putting the focus on the right thing more importantly. The Sabbath is one avenue for which we can spend time seeking the right bread. You know, we don't have to go out and gather as, and work. We have the opportunity to rest and we have the opportunity to have this extra bread being left over for us at this time. How do we treat the Sabbath? You know, how do we treat any of God's holy days for that matter? When we think about Jesus Christ, we think about him being our daily bread. And we and, and that's referenced in Matthew 4, 4 in the uh, prayer the model prayer is says, give us this day our daily bread. He's not asking in that prayer for us to ask for stockpiles, but asking for what we need in that day. Like the Omer. It was a daily amount. Meaning that we are praying on an ongoing basis for what we need in that day. Now, granted, we do provide and we do think for the future, but understanding we can only live one day at a time. We cannot live our lives and fast forward. I can't live my life. My life is going fast enough at this age. I'd like to slow it down from time to time, but I have a lot of external factors trying to push me along. And, and the Sabbath is a time for which we can get off of the merry-go-round of life and spend time in God's word. And not only that, spending time thinking. I don't know how much you spend time thinking and meditating. We know David spent a great deal of time. Some of the things we can think about and meditate is how is he our bread? You know, why does he call himself the bread of life? Why did he use manna as a type of what he is for us today, even today, like he was to them at that time here in John 6? And then how can we eat him? as the bread of life, the living bread, every day of our lives. You know, those are some things for us to think about. You know, I won't turn for uh, the sake of what you understand and what we've talked about so many times. And, and we think about well, the bread of life, the word of God. Jesus Christ was the word of God in John 1, 1. And, you know, he became flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14. And he did all of that to be a witness and a testimony. And it's important, I think, for you and I to always understand that what we are ingesting is not the physical manna that the Israelites ate that was on the desert floor, but it is the word of God. The word of God was Jesus Christ in the flesh. So when we talk about eating his flesh to be a part of him, what we're really talking about and trying to put all the metaphors aside is we are consuming the words of the Bible and consuming them on a daily basis to help us, to sustain us, to go forward in each day of life. That's what we're really talking about. We're talking about consuming and, and it's, you know, it's not the, the diatribe that the Pharisees got into about well, wait a minute, are you talking about cannibalizing and eating your flesh? No, that's not what he's talking about. He is the word of God and the word of God is the flesh of God. He became flesh to die for us. And as a result of that, give us the understanding to be called so that he can then resurrect us at the last day through the understanding that we receive. And the Sabbath is a key component of that. You, know, you think about, again, I go back to that Omer. 
Right? That is stated so many times as we read earlier in Exodus 16. And that omer is not a huge amount. It's only two quarts, roughly, based on what they say. You know, um, not a whole lot. So you weren't supposed to go out and gather. And more than that, you were supposed to go and gather what you needed for that day. And that's very, I guess, close in meaning to what we see in Matthew 6, verse 11, when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And we are to pray this every day. And it's not a reciting of words that's important as much as it's looking to God on a daily basis, like Deuteronomy 3 was referencing of why we were doing that. And we are to seek on a daily basis the Word of God. Do we even read the Word of God each day? That's a question. A lot can happen in the day to get us off track. Maybe the best time is before you get started in your day, read the Scripture, some form of the Scripture. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to memorize everything you read. It's an amazing thing with the minds that we have, our physical minds, that you can read something over and over and over, and you can ask me what I read this morning, and I may not be able to recite it word for word. But it gets registered up here. I've read that everything that you see, you sense, and you read, even though you may not be able to randomly access it quickly, it's up here. And God may be able to randomly access it when he needs it at that time. But if you don't put it up here, if I don't put it up here by consuming the God's word daily, then there's a good chance there won't be anything to access, right? I think it's important before our days get started sometimes that we spend and carve out the time because there'll be a lot of pressures of Satan trying to create problems so that we don't spend that time. That is how we can take our man up on a daily basis. And I find it interesting that the manna kind of evaporated as the sun came out. As the, uh, the things of the day began to start, when you began to function as a human, it went away. You had to get out early to get the manna. And that manna is what you ate throughout the day. And that kept you going physically throughout the day. This manna keeps us going spiritually throughout the day. And we ask for what we need because we don't know what the day may hold for us. There's another interesting component of this, and that's what we see listed as the hidden manna. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. The churches are listed here, and there's a message given to the angel of each church. And as referenced earlier, you know, this manna is the manna that, uh, or, or it's oftentimes referenced as uh, the, the bread from heaven. Uh, it's also um, one time listed as the bread the angels eat. And as messengers of God, and that's what the word angel is, they are sending a message from God. And they're sending them to the churches. And you can get into a lot of discussions and arguments with people. Um, I don't choose to want to do that, but you know, you can say it's either a specific time frame or there's a message here for all of us in the churches of God. And I think there's something for us to learn out of all of this, but I want to hone in because there is something specifically listed about the hidden manna, and that's to the church of Pergamos, which is in chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. To the angel of the church that's in Pergamos write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, of course, we know that comes from Hebrews. The word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. And that word of God is Jesus Christ. I know, in verse 13, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antiochus, or Antiochus, I should say, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have seen fewer things against, I have fewer things against you because you have there some who hold the teachings of Baal. And Balaam is a, is a teaching that is obviously of idols, but, and, and we'll come to that in just a few moments. But who keep the teachings of Balak and teach a tumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immoralities. Of course, we know the story of Balak. We know 
um, of, of how he wanted to create problems for the Israelites by getting them to intermarry, bring in religious activities from the world around them that would create a stumbling block with their relationship with God, and those things created immoralities. Verse 15, so you also have some in the way who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. You know, you think sometimes we think that's only for the disobedient, but even in the church for the disobedient, he comes and he makes war in this case. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. I've heard a lot of things and speculation on what these things are. A couple of things that just I think are important to point out. Pergamos was probably no more wicked than any other city at that time or any of the other churches where the cities are listed in Revelation 2-3. through 3. Some commentaries reference the fact that there was a governor in Pergamos that was like Satan, that he heavily persecuted the church, that he oversaw martyrdom of many of the people there that were in the church. Um, but you think about it, what Satan is really about is about trying to get us to be prideful, to follow his example. As he deceives the whole world, he tries to help us through self-deception, and he will become the accuser of the brethren. How quickly he would probably turn after he gets us to think more highly of ourselves and not be the humble and contrite, but to be the vaunted. And then he points the finger at us quickly like that. And it's important for us to understand this and to understand that, you know, he probably spends a great deal of time trying to twist and create situations where we would seek after pleasure for things in the world that would cause a stumbling block in our relationship with our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ, whether it's on the Sabbath or any day for that matter. Satan dwells where pride is and where self-exaltation is. And that is the very attitude for which, you know, we have to avoid and not just avoid, but at all costs avoid with humility and a contrite heart. For the most part, I don't think there's too many in the churches of God that teach worshiping idols of stone and wood or of uh, meat, eating meat that was sacrificed to gods in the temples around. Um, but, you know, you think about it, anything that becomes between you and Jesus Christ is an idol. And sometimes that idol is ourselves. That's why it's important for us to daily deny ourselves of the wrong things that we are to be a part of. And we are to deny ourselves of the evil around us. It's important for us to look deep within ourselves to make sure that we're not suffering from self-delusion, self-deception and that we're not taking on self-justification and we're not taking on pride. And if we do all these things and we overcome these things, then there's great war that's promised. You know, we have to continually look deeply within ourselves and make sure that we're not falling prey to the devices of Satan and the devices because there's vices and then there's avenues for which the devices go to the vices of life. And you and I have to have the wisdom to discern these things and get them out of our lives and remove them. It's interesting when we think about Israel, we think about the manna, we think about what we saw in Deuteronomy 3, that it was a part of living every, by, every day by not the things that are physically around us, the bread that we eat, but the bread that comes down from heaven. The thing that Jesus said we are to live and strive for in John 6. The hidden manna could, and I'm going to say this as could, not as some say is, could be the fact that the very word of God, as far as its meaning, is hidden for the most part. Hence the idea that we saw in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. The Father draws, the, the scales are removed from our eyes figuratively, and we begin to see God in the, in the Word of God. Many people write in commentaries, write about a lot of stuff that's here in Scripture. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're way off base. 
And with the Spirit of God, we're able to discern rightly the things that are here. That's possible what this hidden manna is, that if we will overcome all these obstacles in life, then we'll be given understanding. There's others that think that we could be given more understanding as the times draw closer, closer to the end. That's possible. That's possible. But one thing's for sure, we have to start day by day ingesting God's word so that he has something to reveal us or to us, I should say. This white stone. Uh, many people reference the fact that in the ancient world, when you came under judgment, if you were absolved of your guilt, you were given a white stone. If you weren't, then you were given a black stone. The black stone meant you were condemned to the judgment. The white stone meant that you were absolved from your guilt. And it could be that through overcoming, through Jesus Christ, as we saw earlier in John 6, you know, we will be to the point where we'll be forgiven of our sins through Jesus Christ and the fact that he came and died for us. And, and then finally, you have this whole idea of the new name. It could reference the idea that as a result of going through this process, we develop God's holy, righteous character. We will have God's spirit and, the, and God's laws written on our hearts, as we saw earlier in Ezekiel 11. And as a result of that, be given new names. Take on the family name, the God family name. It's possible. Some ideas, some things to think through as we consider our practice on a daily basis. So how do we apply all this? How do we move with this? Finally, I'll just say we should rise early. Maybe we need to start gathering our spiritual manna in the mornings each day before our days get started, opening up our Bibles, reading it, hearing God speak to us through the words of God, taking note of what's there and changing our lives or we need to change our lives to be consistent with the word of God.